this is the I Read Comic Books Podcast. I am your host, Mike Rappin. Joining me this week, two shadowy figures in the dark and two beams of light ready to vanquish evil. I'm joined by Renee Rodriguez. Catchphrase. And Kara Shamborski. Definitely one of the two shadowy figures. What's up, Renee? The- <laughs> this week on the show, we have two amazing guests who are the beams of light ready to take Renee and Kara down. I'm joined by Aubrey Lynn Jepson. Howdy. And C.K. Lawson. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for coming on the show, the two of you. Uh, Renee and Kara, thank you as well. You know, I appreciate you both coming back. The show is not dead, everybody. If you're listening to this episode, I Read Comic Books did not end. We got a lot of feedback from people. A lot of questions on the internet. Why are you ending this show? It's my favorite thing in the entire world. I can't believe you'd do this to me, Mike. I know where you live. Don't make this show go away. (laughs) Decided to bring it back this week, so I'm very excited to be talking comic books. But before we get into the two legally mandated questions that I have for every single episode, we have two wonderful guests here today, CK, Aubrey. I guess before we get into things, could you tell us, the folks at home, a little bit about yourselves and what you do? Um, Let's start with you, Aubrey. Yeah, um, so I'm a comics editor and writer. And I'm learning the letter right now, but the main focus for like the last year has been editing, <laughs> um, specifically awesome. working on our, our anthology. So, yeah. Very, very cool. Uh, it's CK. Uh, I'm CK Lawson, and I am mainly a writer, but on the anthology we'll talk about later, I served as an editor and story consultant as well. Uh, other than that, I tutor kids and uh, have three wonderful dogs, and I'm queer and disabled, which drives most of my writing. Awesome, awesome. And the, the, the anthology for folks at home, you've probably seen it in the show notes or the title of this episode. We're talking about Scott Snyder Presents Tales from the Cloakroom, which we'll get into in the second half of the episode. But until then, we're going to talk about comic books. So let's get into those two legally mandated questions that I asked, I mentioned earlier. And those are, how have you been? How have comic books been? Let's start with you, Kara. Um... Are you starting with me because everything that I read this week was both from Kickstarter and full of smut? <laughs> Absolutely. 100%. <laughs> Amazing. I did not pick these themes. They just emerged in what arrived in my mailbox over the past month because, you know, I, kn- I know that some creators are moving away from using Kickstarter, but a lot of them still find it a very helpful place to get work crowdfunded. And I find a lot of... um the really interesting comics that I love reading through these crowdfunded publisher mechanisms. So again, did not plan reading kickstarted books for a Kickstarter episode. It just happened that way. And uh, the stuff that arrived that I had gotten through that crowdfunding format was first of all, us route 31 by also Chartier and Pierre Collinet, uh, which was their inktober challenge. Oh yeah. Yeah. That they did in, October 2021 and I think I I don't know what their exact timeline was but it seems like around the first week of doing the illustrations for the prompts they were like let's turn this into a mini graphic novel so they like set up this kickstarter they're like I don't know they were like we don't know what we're making but we're making it and if you want to own it at the end of it then back our book and it was like fully funded in I think minutes Um, (laughs) yeah Elsa's very popular on kickstarter I think yeah so um, finally got that and read that it had a lot more sex than I was anticipating. And so when I looked at that next to my, my other kickstarted book, I was like, Hmm, a theme emerges. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I love, I love Elsa Chartier's work. This book had a, a very limited color palette, which matched kind of the, almost bleak mood of two lovers on the run from something and it's a super dark book y'all like i'm saying like yeah you see some tits but it's for just like really dark themes a frying pan is used as a weapon at one point classic yeah it's you know it's a it's a short read obviously because it was basically like the 31 drawings and i think there's like a few extras in there to kind of create some more transitions between the the obvious prompts but you know i i really like the work that they that they do so this was uh this was a fun little read um and then in keeping with the theme all right this one i backed in i want to say 2020 i want to say like pre-pandemic or like just when the pandemic started i backed sorted past by iron from iron circus comics um Mm -hmm. and if you're familiar at all with iron circus comics you know that all of their stuff is like sex positive queer friendly erotica and they do a Mm -hmm. focus on anthologies 
So if you remember like the smut peddler anthologies from like, I think they started those in like 2014. And so I like this kind of stuff because you get to see, uh, like I love comic anthologies. You get to see a range of different talents and people who, uh, whose work you might not see in other contexts. And um, I don't know. I think that the iron circus comics, imprint does a lot of uh like like i said the work is erotica it is definitely for adults um <laughs> it is very explicit but um for people who are turned off like mainstream traditional pornography but do want to explore um some different like sexual content then i like i always recommend these anthologies so sorted past was the most recent one and like i said i backed it in like 2020 and it's 2022 and it just arrived because this was one of the books impacted by the pandemic and lockdowns mm -hmm. and supply chains and shortages and we're getting like kickstarter updates from uh spike trotman the the head of the project who's just like anyways um our books are still stuck in china and that was like most of 2021 <laughs> and then it was like anyways our books are stuck in a shipping container in the port of la and eventually we'll get that so it was just like seeing all of the chaos of the pandemic through the scope of this smutty comic book um the th <laughs> the theme of sorted past is just like a a bunch of different um erotic scenarios set at different time periods in history but again like not just focusing you think like oh like oh history so like regency bodice rippers but it's like way more than that there's like all different kinds of people and ethnicities represented and mm -hmm. all different kinds of sexualities and so again like any anything that this publisher puts out i generally am of the opinion that it's going to be pretty good and pretty like I don't know, like interesting, because again, this is not the kind of content that you see all the time in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And I am always looking for just like different ways of getting to explore queerness through comic books. And sometimes you want that to be like really sexual. And <laughs> if that is what you're looking for and erotic fan fiction isn't doing it and you want something visual, try something from Iron Circus Comics. The end. Now you can talk about something besides sex. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's okay. You know, it's, it's good. I feel like we don't talk enough. I think we did an episode a long time ago, slightly talking about erotic comics. We need to bring it back for, for 2022. Um, and this is a great start. So I, I, I looked at this. I don't think I backed this, but I do remember seeing a lot of the woes on Twitter from Spike about all of the shipment issues. And I mean, you could follow the handfuls of different Kickstarters that I've, um, that I've backed and every single one of them had those, those types of issues. So fingers crossed that this isn't currently a problem for our friends here on the show. Uh, <laughs> speaking of um, CK, what have you been reading and how have you been? I've, I've been making it. It's, it's been a tough week. You know how it goes when you're launching Kickstarters, it gets a little insane, but uh, oh, yeah. otherwise I'm pretty good. Uh, as far as reading goes, um, there was a period there for a few months where I didn't get to read a lot of stuff. So I've been, binging like an insane amount the last few weeks this mm -hmm. week for me the the standouts were house of slaughter volume one um outside of uh crowdfunding projects I, I tend to read and trade just so i can read a lot more um totally but uh it, it really uh house of slaughter created by uh werther de la Dera and james tunning the fourth story was james tunning the fourth tate bromble but tate bromble handled the uh, script uh chris sheehan on uh, art i'm probably butchering that name uh, Mikael Muerto on colors and role design killed it on letters and editor being Eric Harburn and published by Boom. Um, that was a mouthful. But uh, House of Slaughter was really impressed by it. You know, I'm always on the lookout for queer content and they did a great job with this. You know, it's a spinoff of Something is Killing the Children. And um, without giving too much away, you know, it's all about a, ha a, a monster hunting house, basically. But one of their key things is that they have to keep their feelings in check. And so this is an exploration of a queer kid who falls in love and how that's against the house rules just because they're not supposed to have strong emotions on anything. Mm. And so it was a really great analogy that a lot of queer youth, I think, experience of that whole not under my roof kind of attitude. Um, mm -hmm. just explored in a different uh, way. And I thought that did a, they did a really great job with that. The art killed it. They have this, these really tender moments between the characters. Um, 
you know, as they fall in love and, you know, maybe just one has a nightmare and he cuddles them in his bed. And it's just really, really sweet and takes me back to, you know, when I believed in love and it was all nice and, you know, dandy. But, uh, mm-hmm. but it's a, it was a really phenomenal read. And And World Design lately, um, I've been paying a lot more attention to lettering recently, which I'm sure Aubrey uh, will, uh, uh, will be proud of me for. And um, And World Design just keeps killing it. Every single time I see them, it almost is like it, it carries the story sometimes. And it's so remarkable. And they really outdid themselves on this one. Um, and I've been also paying a lot more attention to editing names and Eric Harburn keeps popping up in like everything I love. So, um, so I'm uh, a big fan. Um, awesome. the other one I read, uh, the good Asian, the second volume of that, the, the first volume I think was probably one of the top two things I've read this year so far, along with, uh, the many deaths of Layla star, but, um, it was so strong, uh, porn sock, uh, Pisha Shote, apologies if I butchered that on writing, um, Alexander uh, Tefanki on art, the Luridge on colors, Jeff Powell on letters and designing, and Dave Johnson did the covers for that. Uh, they also had a history consultant on that, which was really cool. Uh, Grant Dean or Dan, apologies again, and Will Dennis on editing, which I think also is Scott Snyder's editor. So, uh, so his name popped out for me. Um, nice. This one has. Um, this was, I think. Might have been my first exposure to to Fengi's art, and I think it is uh, really so strong. Um, this volume slipped a little bit for me compared to the first one. This is a just a two volume collection, and then I think you know they're going to try to have him star in maybe like a series of mini series or something. The the main mm-hmm. the main uh, uh, the protagonist, but it was really solid. Um, I really enjoyed it. I think when reading it in trade, it's just that. Um, all of the reveals that happen in a noir, because this takes place during the Chinese Exclusion Act when, you know, the eight Chinese people were not allowed to migrate to the country. Um, and so it was also a history lesson because I don't know if it was like this everywhere else, but in the South, you did not learn this back in the 1990s when I was a kid. And so oh, yeah. it was a, a, a history lesson as well. Um, but uh, the art was killer. The the lettering was killer. And of course, uh, Picha Shote, I always am a big fan of his writing. Um, so it slipped a little bit for me just because I think I read it in trade that all of the reveals that usually happen in a noir at the end happened so fast that it was mm-hmm. hard for me to keep track a little bit. Um, but otherwise, still a phenomenal read. One of the top ones of the year for me. Yeah, I really enjoyed the last half of this. Um, I, I, I agree with you, though. I feel like there was a little bit of like I read it like I had been buying the single issues, but I kept telling myself like I was losing part of the trail as I was reading mm-hmm. it month to month. And I was like, oh, I'll just binge it all in one go. But I totally agree with you that like the big reveals that happen at the end of each issue, like the cliffhangers don't hit as hard when you're reading them all in succession. Right. So definitely feel that. Um, Aubrey, what about you? How have you been? How have comic books been? What have you been reading? I've been okay. And um, I've been reading. So we actually had someone from another podcast we were on recommend uh, the Jordi Bel- Belair Buffy reboot. And Ooh. so I've been working on that. I'm a, I was a Buffy fan as a teenager and a lot of that show has not aged well, especially with stuff about Joss Whedon. And so yeah. it's been interesting to have a different take. It It is a retelling of the story we, we know and love if you love Buffy, but it's set in 2019. And so they have phones and social media and Buffy has a job and, and it, and it kind of points out to some of the more problematic things. Like it retcons them in a way, like, we're not in love with Xander. <laughs> we all realize Xander's kind of <laughs> trash. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, um, and she meets them in a different way. She doesn't meet them like just outside the school. She meets them saving them from vampires. That's within the first three pages. So I'm not spoiling too much, but mm-hmm. I thought it was interesting. And I, I really, um, I'm a fan of Jordy. I've been a fan of her since she was just like doing flatting and stuff and working on stuff with Del- Declan Shelby. So it's been cool to mm-hmm. see her writing it. And then on, the rest of the people in the book are, uh, I totally messed this up in the notes, but um, Dan Moore is the artist, Raul Angulo is the colorist, and then Ed Dukeshire is the letterer. And so I just enjoyed that from a fangirl's perspective, because like I grew up with Buffy. And then I've been reading um, Filth and Grammar by Shelley Bond, and I'm also taking her editing class right now. And it is so good. I've I've taken several editing classes, comics editing specifically from different comics editors. And it's interesting that every single one has a different take on some of the process and what they do differently. And so, 
Yeah. I'm not familiar with this book. Is this uh is this like a, a prose book or is it a comic? It, so it's kind of both. Um it's okay. it's a it's sort of a how to guide on how to how to write comics, how to edit comics, the process. But she's included like glimpses of like some of the parts are like comic books. Like it's a comic, mm -hmm. a few pages are comics. And so she's both telling you about the process and showing you how the art comes to life um, and showing you through comics, how the art comes to life. And so um, she's been in the industry for like over 30 years, uh, oh, yeah. worked at dark Hat horse has worked with Neil Gaiman, like things like that. So just like so much knowledge. So she did a Kickstarter. I think she's going to offer the excess books on her uh, website or something. So if you're interested in that, like I definitely go look for it. Yeah, I was just I was just googling as you were talking. I'm like, oh man, I missed this Kickstarter. How did I miss this I Kickstarter? I'm usually like pretty plugged in on this, so I you've you've definitely piqued my interest. I'm gonna be keeping an eye out for that because that sounds really cool. Like I, I'm not a comic creator by any means, but I'm oh I'm very interested in the creative process around it. Um, and maybe one day when I'm like 75, I'll write that one comic and publish it as a zine that's like a fold up four page thing. <laughs> um, but still, like this kind of stuff really really intrigues me. I love getting the insight. You would love Shelley Bond that if that's comics. the route you want to go. Like, sorry okay, to interrupt, awesome. but you I, would love it. No, no, yeah. Can I ask a quick question going back to Buffy Volume 1? Yeah. Um, so I have never seen Buffy and saw like <gasps> the first half of season one of Angel because a friend made me. But um, oh, no. so do you think this oh, no. do you think this comic book is a good intro for someone like me who has never seen Buffy? Or do you oh, think boy. it's like too tied up in the existing lore? Uh, I think it would be good to read, but it might ruin the Buffy for you because like it cuts out a lot of that misogynistic shit that we didn't have in, uh, like we, we don't, we don't have as much of now. And so, so yeah, so I don't know. What I'm hearing is that it's better. would like this yes. <laughs> and you not probably, the show. Yeah. I mean, the show's a big commitment, especially with Angel. I mean, that's what, 12 seasons altogether? <laughs> and yeah yeah i don't i don't even think i can bring myself i probably rewatched it about 10 years with my 10 years ago with my husband i don't think i could rewatch it now interesting so well i mean i'll I, you i didn't realize that dan mora was on that book um so that's enough to convince me i mean i love jordy belair i'm not like a huge buffy head i've watched the show i really loved it for you know for what it was obviously problems and everything but um yeah dan mora on this is almost enough to sell me to get back into the buffy verse so Look what you've done, Aubrey. I'm sorry. Buffy, it Buffy, happens. Like, like, I never, I don't know. I just never watched it. And then when I was in high school, I remember so many people telling me to watch it that I didn't, like, out of obstinacy. And now I'm just kind of there. It just, it, it's definitely dated, like, 90s feminism. And so, yeah. Yeah. I think I saw one episode of Buffy when I was six, and there was a werewolf in a cage. And I think someone died in that episode. I don't know. Um, You're gonna have to be more specific, dude. Like, I don't know. I saw like one when episode I, of Buffy and was like, nah. But I was also six. Sure. Uh, oh god. But like, I was like the the description though of uh, of this volume. I'm like, you know, I would read that. Whereas anytime someone's tried to get me into Buffy or Firefly or uh, Dollhouse, I've been like, um, you know what? I'm good. I don't care. <laughs> no, fine. See. Firefly, uh, Firefly, Firefly was my jam. <laughs> Everything else, I was like, eh, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. But Firefly, I was like, oh yes, genre fiction, I've tried, world building. I've tried yeah. watching Firefly four separate times, and I quit at the exact same spot every single time. Oh, what what part do you quit at, Renee? Uh, the train episode. Oh, just uh, just, okay. just get past the train episode. That's the one that they had to make to get the network to air as their bad pilot. Like, just just skip that one, then, <laughs> Renee. Like, you don't even. Uh. Yeah, but the first two episodes weren't good either. Oh boy! All right, uh, in my uh, opinion, fine, I fine. just it's just I, Renee, that's why I said that it's. I just <laughs> I'm just saying I just don't think it's my thing. So that's, but, it, that's, that's fine. fine. That's, that's fine. fine. <laughs> Renee, what are how are you? I guess how are comic books been for you? I guess um... apparently I'm in an instigating mood. Um, uh, no, I'm fine. I, I took a lot of naps this week, and uh, highly recommend. Um, yeah. But uh, we need to talk about One Piece. Um, oh, no. One Piece chapter one thousand fifty three by Ichiro Oda and assistants. Um, look, guys, some stuff's going down. 
It's going down. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> well, I woke okay. up. I woke up today to my best friend just texting me One Piece, and I was like, "Yo, yo." Uh huh. I can't spoil it because, like, again, we're over a it thousand. It literally chapters came in. out today. It literally came out an hour and a half ago in the United States. You cannot talk <laughs> about this chapter. I haven't even read it yet, so you can't. You, well, then can't you talk better about get it. on that. You better right. get on it. It's so. I know. Oh, dude, stuff's about to happen. Like, right. I know stuff just ended, but like, oh, I, we, I know. Oh. I know right. the ramifications. How? Of the last 200 chapters are finally coming to fruition. I'm so excited. The past 200 chapters. How compelling is this pirate manga that you're reading a thousand chapters and you're like, oh man, the last 200 really sold it. Like, damn. I think that, I think that in <laughs> itself explains how compelling yeah. it is. Yeah, it's uh, it's really hard to explain without going into a 45 minute presentation about all things One Piece. Just, and just link to I the One Piece that. episode you did. Just, just, just let let me let me hit you with this, Kara. Have you ever mm-hmm. wanted to buckle your swash? <laughs> what? All right, all right, move on, oh, Renee. <laughs> it's a swash buckling sounds... adventure. It's <laughs> yes, buckle it's my great. swash. That sounds filthy, Renee. But yeah. it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Renee, what else have you read? Because you can't talk about 1053. I just won't let you. Okay. I thought that might be the case. That's why I picked two other books. Um, yeah, thank you. So uh, the other book I read was uh, – I need to – I practiced this, so I'm going to try not to screw it up. Doran Dodoran, Chapter 27 by, again, Osuka and Assistance, which is a uh, manga that's about samurai fighting Mononoke. So they're like monsters. They just kind of keep – they're coming from the Mononoke world and they go into the human world and they eat humans. So there's now like this policing squad that uh, can – uh, channel spirit energy and they defeat mononoke and our main character has no spiritual energy whatsoever but he befriends a nice mononoke who uh, also wants to defeat bad mononoke and make a nice happier friendly friendlier world and so they go around beating up mononoke and it's really fun it's action-packed i really like it so far we're only in chapter 27 so i know it doesn't hit the uh the 50 chapter rule that i've mentioned but it all of it is on the Shonen Jump app, so I would recommend it. Uh, I'm having a great time with it. and uh, yeah, That one looked pretty fun. Yeah, I, I like it so far. And uh, Ayashimon ended, so I'm like, oh, no. I know, rip, right? Like, I can't even believe that, uh, like, probably one of the most exciting, like, new series that's come out in a while just ends abruptly. That's exactly I how that I movie. felt, and I was I was gutted. But, you know what? We still have this one, so. We'll have to do a retrospective on that book. Yes. And, and Time Ghost Time Ghostwriter Paradox, whatever that book was called. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll make you read that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, then the last thing I read was Mission Yuzakura Family, Chapter 134 by Hitsuchi Gondaira and Assistants, um, which is about a spy family. And... The last 10 chapters or so have been kind of iffy, but it's, we're gearing up for the next big arc. So I'm really excited to see where this series goes. I really love this series. I've talked about it multiple times on this podcast. It's funny, but it's also got a lot of action, and it does have a lot of heart in it. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's a very solid series. Um, it's a very solid shonen series, but it's also just a very solid like manga pick. So I don't know if they've released... Uh, volumes in the u.s i haven't seen any but the whole series is available to read on the shonen jump app and uh no Mm -hmm. i'm not sponsored by shonen jump but uh if you want to hit me up shonen jump (laughs) i am available give us a call viz (laughs) we'd appreciate it gotta shoot your shot guys yeah well for me this week uh it's it's been a wild week i've read a whole bunch of stuff and unfortunately it's all been just okay with the rare exception here um of dory door was amazing as i predicted uh last week on the show i love that book and i bought like the next 12 volumes because i'm that hyped about it i'm very excited um i would talk more about it but i'm at this point trying to race nick white who's on the show um to get ahead in that book because he started reading it at the same time but he's reading faster than me and keeps threatening me with spoilers and i don't know what's gotten into his soul that he wants to be so evil um but i'm calling him out right now i don't think he's listening live on discord but what a rude person uh (laughs) nick's really fast and loose (laughs) with spoilers i avoid him sometimes because of that i know he's he's very bad about it 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 makes me sick to my stomach um (laughs) but uh i did i did also read uh a book from aftershock comics called a calculated man uh number one came out last week this is written by paul tobin you may know paul tobin from his eisner award-winning series bandette that he co-created with his wife colleen coover um this uh has art by alberto albuquerque uh colors by mark engelert uh letters by taylor esposito and the synopsis for this book is 
a verifiable math genius named Jack Beans used to run the numbers for the Pinafore crime family until one day he ran them too well and concluded that the only way out of his life was in a casket or a witness protection pro program. So he turned state's evidence he turned state's evidence and ran. It's a really weird way to say that. But yeah, the other caveat of this that's not in the synopsis is that this character can't tell a lie. Like, I don't know why. There's probably some story reason that we haven't gotten to yet. Uh, so this book is really bonkers in that we've got a character who is an expert at running numbers and making plans and understand, like following through logic and all these crazy schemes, uh, but he can't tell a lie. So his big problem is that he wants to get out of the life of crime or he wants to be able to live a life with his girlfriend, but he can't tell her what he does for a living. And he's like, eventually she's going to ask me directly what I do and I can't lie to her. And this crime family won't let him out of their life of crime because he's too good at helping them, you know, squash beefs with other, other crime families in this big city. So the story bounces back and forth between Jack Beans, this crazy mathematician guy, and the two FBI agents who he is in the informant to um, as the FBI agents are moving to the place where they're supposed to meet Jack Beans. Now we're following Jack Beans as he's doing some things to basically get himself out of this crime family. And we're following the FBI agents who are telling or talking about his past, um, introducing this new FBI agent to the process of why this guy is now an FBI informant. So we get to hear about his past, everything that he's done and why he's basically turning coat and trying to basically turn all this, this crime family stuff in. Um, it's a really interesting book that I thought was going to be bad, like from the get go, but I wanted to try it because the premise is interesting, but it like really hits the beats of nailing like a really well paced comic. Um, and for, I think 30 pages, it felt like I read a whole graphic novels worth of content in the best way possible like i know that each issue is going to be extremely dense in the best way possible um it's really rich and every page is full of information in uh, like a really really fun way because it's kind of like a whodunit heist thing as you don't know what jack beans's actual plan is as it's slowly unfolding over the first issue and probably subsequent issues so really dig that book if you want to try something that's kind of out of the blue, um, this is a calculated man by Paul Tobin over at Aftershock Comics. It's really, really cool. Mike. This yeah. like as you're describing this book, I'm just thinking, ah, yes, 2010's USA cable programming. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, is it not giving like burn notice, like law oh, and yeah, order yeah. reruns? It totally does, That's... but it doesn't feel like as boring as those television shows are. <laughs> Excuse you, Burn Notice was a treasure. I was like, going to say, I, never... I really liked Burn Notice. <laughs> I never watched Burn Notice, so I don't really know. I Burn Notice um, was great. Really quick, I, I do want to talk about one more book, and that is Dual Power Bomb number one. <sighs> I think our every single person in our Discord read this last week. Um, I hope that this book sold really well because it totally deserves it. This is Daniel Warren Johnson, who's on writing art and colors. Mike Spicer did the lettering. All I can say is come on with this book. Like it's a combination of really kinetic, exciting art and action with a really strong story at the heart. I think Daniel Warren Johnson consistently delivers a story that feels really fun and exciting, but there's a humongous heart at the center of it that will pull at all sorts of heartstrings as the story goes on. So we've got this, this, um, this daughter of the former world championship who dies like that's not a spoiler it's in the first couple pages um and she wants to become this wrestling championship um Hell story yeah. story story happens um somehow a necromancer is involved and it's the coolest thing ever daniel warren johnson clearly has a love for wrestling has a love for bizarre wizardry and explosions i mean if you've read any of his other stuff murder falcon wonder woman uh dead earth if you read uh extremity like he loves crazy sci-fi insanity stuff and i'm really excited to see what he does with the mix of wrestling and necromancy that's going to come out of this book um it was a pleasure to read from start to finish and i i can't recommend this book enough it's going to be killer seven issue miniseries bing bang boom this book is going to kick butt i'm so excited amazing uh, I, my I question at the end bought. of this is can this dude miss? Can Daniel Warren Johnson miss? I just want to know. I don't think that he can. But yeah, glad you bought it, Renee. Yeah, I bought it yesterday at literally because I saw that it was wrestling on the cover and like also that title, do a power bomb. I was like, yes, Hell yes, yeah. all the yes. So yes. I'm excited to read it. <laughs> Probably going to read it today. Yeah, good, good. Uh, well, let's let's move on. Let's talk about books that we're going to be reading. Um, I guess, you know what, we're going to take a quick break now that I say that because it's, it's been a bit and we do want to get to other things. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk to CK and Aubrey more about their Kickstarter. But we're also going to dig into what's on the top four pile. So we'll be back in just a minute. For 
our show this week, we are talking to CK and Aubrey, editors on the Scott Snyder Presents Tales from the Cloakroom Kickstarter. But before we get into that, we've got to talk about comic books that are on the top of our pile, comic books that we're reading next, whether they're new, old, upcoming, reread, or anything. June is our Goodreads book of the month for your favorite comics that you read in 2021. So if you're reading something from last month or last year, totally acceptable for today's top of my pile. So let's just jump right into things. Uh, let's start with you, Renee. What's on the top of your pile? I'm so glad you asked, Mike. Um, <laughs> so I okay. I uh, went to my local comic book store uh, yesterday, which is crazy. Haven't done that in a long, long, long while. Good for you, Renee. Uh, but I picked up a book that I have heard about through uh, the interwebs, you know, all different kinds of spaces, and I've just been dying to read it, and that is Radiant Black, Volume 1. Uh, it's written by Kyle Higgins, uh, art by Marcelo Costa, and there's also co-writing credits to Cherish Chen and guest artist Eduardo Ferragato, Darko La Fuente, Natalia Marquez, Mikel Muerto, Rod Fernandez, and lettering by Becca Carey. Uh, this book has been described as like – uh, Power Rangers meets Invincible. So I'm mm -hmm. like, say no more. I want it. Um, <laughs> so I've, I've heard a lot of hype about this book. It looks great. I, I saw it yesterday as I was like, I was actually about to leave. I'd gotten my manga and a couple single issues and a, a trade of some other stuff that I'd be going. I was like, ah, should, should I just walk out right now? Or is there something else? You know, and then like a sign. Like like a scene in a movie. I look mm -hmm. up and I see it. Our eyes met across the aisle. And I was like, you're coming with me. But in a not scary way. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm excited. And the point is that I'm glad to have grabbed this book. And I'm excited to read it is uh, what I should have okay. said. Interesting. I'm, I'm very excited to hear your thoughts on this because that description of Power Rangers meets Invincible is 100% true. I'm really curious to hear what you think of this after you finish it. Yeah, well, that um, description, so. like I added this to my hoopla borrows as Renee was speaking. I was like, say no more. Right? If I could chime in on that one as well. I read it a couple of weeks ago because I'm not a huge um, like superhero like uh, person. It is sure. so I'm going to be the first to do it, but it has to be done. It is so fucking good. Like it is <laughs> insanely good. I can't recommend it enough. See, and that, that is a ringing endorsement. I, you know, if someone self-described non-superhero fan is into this. I think that that's enough to say that this book is going to be solid. So Renee, we're going to have to chat next time you're Amazing. on the show after our July break. You know, it's going to be it's going to be something to talk about. We may even have to do a callback to the, some of the earliest episodes of IRCB where we do a big, long discussion about it. But I've also just decided that I'm going to play a playlist that is just all the uh, Power Rangers theme songs, just all in one go <laughs> and then just read it while doing it. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, that sounds amazing. Uh, I guess, CK, let's let's jump over to you. What's on the top of your pile? What are you looking forward to reading next? Uh, so next up, I have And We Love You uh, by Failhound. Uh, just dropped a couple weeks ago um, digitally. So I'm very, very excited. Or maybe it was just last week. I think it was just last week. I'm very excited for it. It's uh, basically, you know, a soldier who bleeds memories is about all I can say about it. I don't want to give too much away. But... I'm um, sorry. What? Yeah, this <laughs> wow. is a well, this is a follow up to um, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, but Commander Rao R A O. Yeah, Rao or yeah. Rao. So this is a, if I'm not mistaken, a prequel to that. Um, and um, but yeah, basically, you know, it's going to be filled with tears and heartbreak because it's Failhound, and very very excited for it. Yeah, I I backed the Commander Rao book. I. I, I don't think that I read it. <laughs> I don't think I read it yet. I think it's just been sitting in my Dropbox for a long time. So this is this is the encouragement that I needed to get back to that. So maybe I'll go find the copy of this book too once I finish that. And the other one I have sitting in my uh, email waiting for me is Small Bites, uh, which is another um, uh, crowdfunded one. Uh, Matthew Wilding on um, writing duties. And I think it's just a bunch of his short stories where he did um, a different story with, with various artists. So I can't really speak to to exactly what that. I'm sure it's just going to be all over the place as far as stories goes. So I'd hate to you know lump it into a certain genre or anything. Mm -hmm. like that. Knowing that Very it's cool. going to be creepy and dark. 
because <laughs> yeah. I've known it, him for a couple of years, and it's it usually creepy and dark. <laughs> it definitely gives creepy dark vibes, but I didn't want to make the assumption that everything in there would be. Creepy I'm, dark I'm sure there's other stuff too, but you can. That's a that's a good expectation for Matt stuff. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Uh, well, Kara, what about you? What are what are you excited for? What are you reading next? Okay. I really want to read Flung Out of Space, inspired by the indecent adventures of Patricia Highsmith by Grace Ellis and Hannah Templer. So I don't know anything about Patricia Highsmith, the person. The New York Times Book Review talked about this book this week, and they described the art as being like a similar vibe to Girl in Dior which is a French comic book that is miraculously available in English. So for once, when I go off of it, like, anyways, if you learn French, you can read this comic book. You can go read <laughs> Girl in Dior for a fictionalized account of a model modeling for Christian Dior in France in the 50s. And the art lines are so clean and it's so pretty. And uh, anyway, so the second the review said the art is similar in feel to that. I was like, say no more. It's like a bonus that Patricia Highsmith was apparently a very classy mid-century lesbian. But uh, anyway, so I, I reserved Flung Out of Space from the library. I reserved one of Patricia Highsmith's book from the library, books from the library. And that's how I learned. I think she wrote Carol, which was adapted into the film with Kate Blanchett and Rooney Mara. Mm. I was just like, all right, we're just going to we're just going to dive right in. Classy lesbianism. Let's go. Um, and then I'm probably going to pick up some Miss Marvel again because I start. So I started Hell watching yeah. the show. I love it. I made my mom watch the first episode with me. And I was like, anyway, mom, they changed her origin story a little bit, but I know why. And she's like, well, why? I'm like, well, in the show, she gets her powers from this magical bracelet from a family member. And in the comic books, <clears throat> The Terrigen mists merge on Manhattan and it brings out the inhuman gene and the inhumans are like the X-Men, but not. And just the look on my mom's face, I was like, anyways, this is why people hate superhero comics. <laughs> uh huh. I was going to say, I'm, I'm glad to know that they changed it because I, to go back and explain the Terrigen bomb would be a totally, I just, uh, totally like, different thing. Like I was, I was thinking about it and I was like, wow, I really, I really just picked up the Miss Marvel book and was immediately confronted with all of the political implications of the Inhumans and all of their nonsense. Like you read Miss Marvel and you almost immediately have to like care about Medusa and whatever that dude was in Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness who had that really cool death scene. Spoilers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, that spoilers. no spoilers. A... I... Sorry. No spoilers. Whoa. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I haven't seen it. No, I'm so oh, sorry. No. Xander, edit I that haven't out. Seen it. Yes, I'm so sorry. Oh my god! Edit gosh. it out right. of my brain, Xander. Oh my god! Um, she was doing that. I thought she was just. Sorry, being, guys. I thought you didn't remember, and I was trying to be helpful. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I had four days to watch it on Disney no. Plus. No, no, I'm sorry. no. That's I'm okay. Nick. That's okay. <laughs> You're... I'm so sorry. Um, Oh God! Okay, well, Aubrey, I'm stop talking now. I'm sorry, Aubrey. Since you've completely ruined everything in my entire life, uh, I can just go now. Kidding. I can just go. Yeah. No, no. Like, what are you excited for reading so next? Sorry. It's okay. TikTok already spoiled it for me, so don't worry about it. Okay. Um, but uh, what what are you excited for? Um, I am excited for ending this podcast and leaving because I'm so embarrassed that I did that. I really thought you were forgetting. I'm so sorry. Um, okay, <laughs> I'm looking. So I've had Wonder Woman Historia, the first two issues, just sitting on my desk for weeks. I need to read those. That's Kelly Sudaconic, Phil Jimenez. I'm, mm -hmm. I, I wrote down the people who worked on the first one. Hi-Fi, Arif, Ar Arif, I'm not sure. Uh, Pirianto, Romula, Farado, I'm so sorry, and Clayton Cowles. And then um, I'm just, I've, I mean, I've seen Kelly Sudaconic's been teasing art from that for like a year and a half. And it's just, yeah. I, I just need to dive into it. And then Witchblood, that's another one that's been sitting on my desk for forever. Uh, Matthew Ehrman on writing, Lisa Sterl on art, Gab Contrast on coloring, and then Jim Campbell on lettering. And I think that's Vault Comics. Yeah, that's Vault Comics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've just been looking. It, the art looks great on that, too. It's just right up my alley. And then um, also, and we love you with uh, Fellhound and Lucas Gatoni on lettering. 
So Fell's just got a really stunning art style, and I'm really looking forward to that one. Yeah, that that Witch Blood book is fantastic in the art. I love Lisa Sturl's look for everything. Like, yes, everything just looks so cool in that book. I have like the the she did a tarot deck called Modern Witch. And I bought that before I even knew that she was a comic artist. And then I was like, oh my God. Oh. Yes. <laughs> I love oh, it. Oh, read that one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. That's really, really cool. Well, I guess for me, I guess before I get into my picks, we've got some folks hanging out with us in our Discord. Uh, Kev this week is looking forward to reading Jurassic League number one and two, which by far has the craziest covers I've ever seen in my life. Uh, Paul G is looking forward to re- reading Rassel, which I think he, they said a new edition just came out. Um, Danny is looking forward to reading Dark Crisis, Young Justice number one. And Gray is going to be reading The Last American by John Wagner, Alan Grant, and Mike McMahon, which is crazy to see the you know some of the major creators on Judge Dredd doing a book that isn't Judge Dredd. That's just bizarre to me. Um, but I am uh, <clears throat> this week. I'm looking forward to reading Immortal X-Men number three. I know I'm like the most obvious person in the world. Uh, but Kieran Gillen, uh, Lucas Wern- Wernick on art, get colors by David Curio, letters by Clayton Coles. The synopsis is one over 100 years ago. Irene Adler wrote 12 books. A sequel is long overdue. If you're not plugged into the X-Men, I'm so sorry. None of this makes sense. Uh, you know, Destiny is a character that's existed in the X-Men that I think fans of the X-Men for a long time have been like, where's Destiny? We're, re- we're bringing back all these mutants to life because of all the things that have been happening since House of X and Powers of Ten. What happened to Destiny? Why isn't she back? And then they brought her back because Mystique decided to pull a fast one on Charles Xavier and Magneto and Moyer McTaggart. And now Destiny's back, which is causing all sorts of chaos because we're in the era of Destiny of X. That's what it's called now. Um, I guess for the record here, all I want to say is I'm excited. I really like what Kieran Gillen has been doing with this book. I think I've said it for the last two issues. It's amazing. Uh, we're going to get a story from the perspective of Destiny, which is going to be real, which is really exciting to me because I don't think we've ever really seen things from her perspective as a precog who can see all of these crazy, insane possible futures, um, which is the downfall of the X Men, supposedly, which you got to read all of House of X and Powers of Ten. I won't bore you. But the one thing I will say is that. <laughs> I uh, I was doing a Google search for Irene Adler because I wanted to make sure that the character was in the synopsis was the correct person and I wanted to just make sure I got everything spelled right. If you do a blank search for Irene Adler, you end up getting a ton of results about Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes. Holmes. Um, yeah. <laughs> now, I was someone who was a little obsessed with the Benedict Cumberbatch Sherlock Holmes for a spell and like suddenly this name is clicking for me because I remember when that show came out I was like, Irene Adler. No, no, no. That I know who that is. Why do I know who that is? And it's because I knew who Destiny was, but I couldn't remember. And so as I saw Destiny, Destiny's name, Irene Adler, in the synopsis, I'm like, oh, everything's full circle. Um, is this all related back to Arthur Conan Doyle's stories? I don't know. But um, I, that's my little weird tidbit. But who didn't? Did everybody else love the old Sherlock show? Because <laughs> the old Sherlock show, the new Sherlock show, because I mean, I it was is obsessed. old at this point, because... Really? I was obsessed yeah. like a Tumblr kid. Like, it was crazy. I thought of the Robert Downey Jr. show because, like, uh, Rachel McAdams oh, plays oh, every Irene Adler. so much. Yeah. God, oh, she yeah, was, like, yeah, my yeah. icon for a good five years after that film. She was good in that film. Yeah. She needed more airtime. Um, yeah. I, I'm actually in the middle of rereading the original Sherlock Holmes stories and thinking about the recent adaptations has me all, like, riled up because... Sherlock Holmes is such a good character and they keep making him mean. But if you read the original stories, he's not mean. Like Watson goes out of his way to explain that he's like kind and a good listener and genuinely cares about justice. And I feel like in the more recent adaptations, they're just like, anyways, he's like Iron Man, but in a suit. <laughs> like, yeah. So I, uh, yeah. So I'm really enjoying rereading the original stories, but um, yeah. Uh, to change the topic before i talk about sherlock holmes for another hour because i will do that i was gonna say we, we could get into a, this could become a sherlock holmes podcast but maybe that's what we'll do after the summer break um <laughs> but let's uh could i throw in a have fun little more. trivia fact real quick about irene adler please it's okay so back when uh marvel's editor-in-chief had a blanket no gays are allowed in any of our books back in the 90s oh boy uh mm-hmm. claremont snuck in that Mystique and Irene were lovers by using the French term for lovers to tie it back to the discussion of French stuff earlier, and nobody caught mm. it. So just little trivia. That's okay because I knew I know that people were like, "This is in canon." I couldn't remember 
where in canon not that i've read all of the 90s you know x-men or whatever but mm-hmm. that's interesting i didn't know that was the reason or that was how they established that isn't it amazing I... what people could get away with before google translate was a thing yeah <laughs> true <laughs> oh my goodness well i guess the other you know like i said we've got these two wonderful guests here we're here to talk a little bit about this kickstarter that's coming out so i guess uh ck or aubrey one of you what what is this kickstarter this scott snyder that you has the name scott snyder and i guess you know tales from the cloakroom uh, and why should people be excited about this book you want me to take it over okay so basically uh you know when everyone started all the comic writers started to have uh, the subsects coming out about, I guess it was about a year ago now. Um, mm-hmm. Scott Snyder stood out to me um, because he was offering a writing class with it. And I was like, oh, I've never taken a comics writing class, even though I, I write. Let's try this out. And um, so a few months into it, you know, they they put up a Discord for all of the students. It had like a thousand plus in, people in it. I am not a tech person, so I had no other discords. So I followed every single little message in that uh, server. And basically what ended up happening is another of our um, editorial team, Joji Schuster, um, had this little nugget of an idea of, hey, what if we created an anthology um, where, you know, we could get a lot of our stories um, produced and maybe, you know, present them to Scott. But he didn't feel like he had all of the skill sets to be able to pull that off. So he brought on Ben O'Grady, who has some um, some published uh, comics. And Ben O'Grady, I think, announced in the server, the Discord server, hey, if anybody's interested in joining us with this anthology, let us know. And so then a bunch of us migrated over to this. Um, we made this little Discord server for everybody that was interested. And then people started um, submitting score- stories. It was limited to six pages. Um, and basically at that point, uh, Aubrey Lynn Jepson got brought on. Uh, she is the one by far who has the most editorial experience, who has the most, um, or the best graphic eye. She has graphic design work under her belt. And so not to speak for her, but, uh, I know she doesn't like to toot her own horn. So she came on board as a story consultant and he asked her, you know, Hey, do you want to write a story? And she was like, no, I want to consult for the other stories. And then she realized that, hey, this would be a great opportunity to flex all of my other editorial muscles that I've been trained for. (laughs) And so then she stayed on board for that. And then I got brought on last. I had submitted a story, but then really wanted to learn about the editorial process. So what Aubrey did is she broke all of us into these little editorial feedback groups based on clumping genres together. And um, during that, I just got so invested in the process that then I kind of Aubrey took me under her wing and I've been involved at every step since because I was very interested in learning everything I could about self-publication. And uh, that's how it came about. Right from the get-go, Scott Snyder had our back. He's been our cheerleader. He is not um, involved in the editorial process at all. This is very much an indie project. And mm-hmm. uh, But he and his assistant, uh, editorial assistant, uh, or assistant editor, sorry, Tyler Jennings, they've been extremely supportive. They allow us to use his name, which was really surprising. And, you know, he Mm -hmm. tweets for us and blah, blah, blah. So that's how it came about is from that writing class. So not all of the artists are in the writing class, but of course, all the writers that are in the anthology are part of the class. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, yeah, that's that's really exciting. I mean, like, I feel like with a, a one two punch of like one, you've got Scott's name and, and two, you've got probably one of the coolest covers I've seen for an anthology in a long time. Um, Like this is a really attractive Kickstarter, I guess. What are what how did this whole book come together? I guess as you guys organize things on this discord, um, like what was the the premise for everything? And like, did, was there a centralized theme or is there like do whatever you want genre wise or, or something like that? Is there I guess, how did it all all get organized to, to tell these short stories to try to keep it within the constraints of the like 120 or so pages you're aiming for? Yeah. So they had uh, up to six pages and the the linchpin was they had to have a jacket somewhere in the story. It could be the through line for the story. It could be just shown in the story. Um, like it could be an Easter egg, but it, there had to be a jacket somewhere in the story. Um, okay. The other thing was that they couldn't be this anthology was not a launching off point for any series. So if they wanted to like do a to be continued and then continue it by themselves, we were like, Nope, this is the wrong place for that. Um, Hell yeah. Cause uh, just, as a reader, that's really attractive to me. Yeah. Just, to, just to clarify the, the jacket reason was because Scott Snyder's imprint is oh, yeah. uh, best jacket studios. 
and or best jacket ah, press and okay. so we wanted okay. to pay homage to him by going hey we don't want to restrict our creators but what if we tied them all together through a jacket yeah that's adorable <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah it just kind of that's what ties all the stories together and like we've had people be like wow this is a lot of genres but most mm -hmm. of the people who've read the the full proof have been like oh but i can it has a good like uh cadence to the reading like we the way those stories are laid out and stuff like that that like there's a little bit of something for everyone like if you like horror we have horror if you like slice of life we have slice of life um I just like things that make me cry. We definitely have some of that. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for sending over a proof that I read at like one in the morning and had to grab Kleenexes for. Oh. So, um, <laughs> gee, I wonder whose story that was. Um, I, um, hmm. <laughs> there's a few of them. Yeah. No, I mean, but I do appreciate you sending over that proof because it was a really interesting look. Because I, I, you know, read through the Kickstarter, thought it looked kind of cool. Um, and then, you know, read the proof and I was like, oh, wow, like this is all over the place but in a really interesting way and like yeah like ck your story definitely like broke my heart how dare you that was the reason i brought you on the show so i could yell at you about it <laughs> yeah, uh, i get that a lot <laughs> but it's great it's honestly really really good and it's, it's really interesting to see bouncing around different genres but nothing felt like out of place you know what i mean that's what we get a lot to to go back to what i was saying yeah is um we were like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Because there's like, there are eight different genres, even though they clump around three horror slice of life and sci-fi. Uh, that's 75% of the collection are uh, those three genres uh, uh, equally. Mm -hmm. But um, so I sat down and I did a story order and I was very, like, I'm very, very proud of that apparently because every single response we've gotten from people who read the rough, the whole uh, rough proof was somehow you managed to make this flow work where I never got, uninterested and so that's a uh, that's really validating yeah so earlier we were talking about how editorial processes are different for everyone so what like how did that process go for each of you on this project oh like like uh ck mentioned like i jumped in i was just gonna story consult i was gonna set up i was gonna organize their peer review process because we wanted everybody to look at because there's so much benefit in reviewing the work of others that for oh, yeah. especially not everyone on this this anthology is new so let me let me preface that but a lot of them were newer writers or at least new to comics and so we set that up and two we didn't have like a traditional submission process like usually you know someone says submit and then you get 120 submissions basically it was like if you write the script and you are dedicated to producing your comic you can get in um unless the only caveat with that was we did have some people that we worked with for several hours, like they got a lot of editorial feedback. So I think they benefited as well that when we got to the deadline, like it just wasn't quite ready for production. And so mm -hmm. we really tried to get everyone across that finish line. So if you were in the class and just wanted to be published, this was a great opportunity because there's a lot more barriers in, in editing and publishing outside, even in indie comics, when you're submitting to anthologies and stuff. So, mm -hmm. and then we just like, we did, you know, the traditional things that go along with a comic that a lot of people don't know about. So we, we, we reviewed the scripts at least twice and then they went into art production and then they came back to us showing us the art and then they went into lettering and they came back to us and showed us the lettering and like Chris proofread every single comic. Um, like I was pretty burned out at that point, but like, and we, you know, checked the sizing to make sure the sizing was correct. And there were a few times we had to go back and be like, this is going to get cut off. Um, you got to fix it. So hmm. I, it's a really long process that I knew going into it, it would be, but it's amazing when you're, once you're in it, how long it takes to just produce an anthology. Yeah. And we wanted to honor, uh, the whole point of Scott Snyder. Scott, he's so passionate. You know, if you listen to his lectures, which by the way, you can sign up for his Substack for $7 a month and have access to every single lecture he's done for the past year. Uh, so it's a great deal now, but, um, uh, when we, you know, he's so enthusiastic about it and he's so supportive just in his classes in general when he speaks. And we wanted to honor that by, you know, in our Discord, we help provide resources to learn how to pitch to um, uh, to anthologies and things like that. And Aubrey and I got really invested in um, helping with script review. We easily spent 120 hours helping those 20 creators. And so it's no joke that we were really committed to helping people learn and hone their craft. Not not all of those hours were spread equitably, of course, but 
um, sure. we were definitely committed to that process. And that's what's great about our Discord too, is we have this nice little family and we're constantly talking to each other about, you know, uh, this pitch didn't get accepted. Could y'all analyze it? And we'd have pitch analysis meetings. We hang out once a month and do all kinds of trivia. It's like we've developed a little family. So it's not even just all about the anthology. It's about creating this little family. And that's been really nice. What I also like about this is I feel like at every single comic convention panel I've ever been to, at least one person asks, how do I break into comics? And the answer is always make comics. So right, but it's right. like, no, I need a step by step process. So it's it's nice that there are starting to be some more like structured training wheel options where it is like a learning environment and there is an opportunity to have some work published so that you can actually be like, okay, now I've started a portfolio. Okay, now I have this experience as opposed to just, well, I guess I'll make a comic and maybe magically the publishing fairies will put it in front of people. Like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And along those lines too, you know, we're, we're very proud that over half of our creators are from uh, underrepresented communities, um, whether it be 2S LGBTQIA plus or women creators or uh, BIPOC or uh, disabled, or if you prefer differently abled like myself. Um, but uh, even there you have, you can't just say make comics cause there's all kinds of, of barriers. And we dealt with that in one of these situations where like, even with anthology submissions, if they pay you 50 bucks a page, like it's going to cost you easily 125 bucks a page to make. So it's like when you mm -hmm. say make comics and just go out there and do it, it's like a tons of people. That's a very privileged statement because a lot of people don't have that side money to create it. And until you're in with the indie crowd, you're not going to get a lot of artists on board to be like, hey, yeah, I trust you enough to do like, I'm not going to make any money until let's do a profit share. Like, you know, mm -hmm. and, and justifiably so because artists, you know, deserve their money. So it's, um, yeah, the whole make comments thing is a little, a little bit of a privilege statement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been, I've been at this for 10 years on and off. Um, and that's, that's always the advice you get. And I've, I've gotten advice, like learn how to do another part of the process, which as an editor, now I do want to learn that because I want to be able to understand every part of the process, but like, that's not going to work for everybody. Like it's not going to work to go learn how to color. Um, if you've got, you know, if you're working 60 hours a week and you can barely find time to write your comics. So I think this helped lower that barrier in a lot of ways. Cause it was just like, if you do the work you're in. Um, and I think, yeah, that I know what they're saying with that advice, but it's hard to understand it until you're in the process. So, yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things where like it, probably someone who has, who has made it through that process is hard to explain the, the many, many, many steps that they had to go through to get to that point where they were actually making the comics because you don't think about them like in a, in that context, you know, like understanding how to do calculus. It's hard to explain like maybe every single step because you already know like how to do calculus. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that translates Comics perfectly well, but the same uh, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely the same thing. Yeah. Definitely the same. Well, thing. I, mean, I guess um, I think that kind of works because you have to know other math and stuff like that to even yeah, yeah, start yeah. to do calculus. But it's like, how do you explain calculus without explaining algebra and all the other facets in it? I think. That and that's what's been nice about both our Discord and the bigger Scott Snyder Discord is people ask those questions all the time. How am I supposed to find an artist? And I, we're like, here's a resource. Follow this link. Follow this link. These are great places mm -hmm. to find, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, artists. And they'll be like, well, how do I do a pitch? Okay, go go read this person's uh, blog. They're really great at describing pitches uh, and different things like that. So it's a very supportive community and uh, it's willing to share their knowledge. It's been nice. Yeah, that sounds that's, incredible. It's really awesome. <laughs> One of the one of the questions that I had and somebody in the Discord is asking, um, like you you mentioned a little bit, like how were the artists selected for this book? If everybody came out of this as like an editor or a writer or something um, from the Scott Snyder classes, um, how did you go about picking artists for the various folks on the on the project? Yeah, so they were responsible. The writers were responsible for setting up their own art teams, and if they did need assistance okay. finding people, like there was always like. Uh, people in our in our smaller discord just for the anthology going hey go look at this person or hey I just worked with this person they're great or hey my friend just worked with this person they're fantastic and so it was and that's like the bread and butter of any comics you have to be able to I'm not very good at reaching out to people like I I get really clammy social socially online 
Um, mm-hmm. So it was a lot of like helping guide people and being like, here's, here's a sample work for hire agreement that you can use with them. Here's different things to help them like cross that finish line working with an artist. And then also advice about like, don't, you know, like this is collaborative. Um, I come from a place where I've worked with people who didn't treat their artists as co- collaborative partners. They treated them as employees. And I right. watched how badly that went for them and how the communication just wasn't there. And yeah, so teaching them like this is best practice for comics, like treat them like your collaborator, treat them like someone you're working with, not someone that's working for you, because that's not going to fly very well in the in the bigger comics, you know, um, ecosystem. And so stuff like that, just like practical advice, because like not everybody understands. And and right now, comics can be so focused on the writer that they that new people to comics, new writers to comics don't remember. Like you have to create, you have to credit your entire creative team, because you mm-hmm. didn't just create mm-hmm. this book. This book would not exist with you alone. So things like that, yeah, yeah. And um, to build off of that for a second, I do think it's important to clarify. You know, uh, Ari and I have said a few times. You know these about half of these have never been published these create these writers and the other half are are emerging creators but along the lines of um you know most of them would get in it's because we were so impressed with the quality of the stories like aubrey and i were dming each other on the side being like can you believe how strong these are and it blows my mind on some of these that they have never been published before it just it, it i can't believe it and so i do just want to make sure it's clear that we weren't just like everybody's in like, like Oprah, yeah. Winfrey, like you get in and you get in. No, it's not <laughs> like that. Uh, they had to have a strong story and, uh, and just so happens they either had a great story and did, that needed a little tweaking or we worked with them diligently until the story was there. And also with regard to art teams, a couple of them do their own art. Alyssa Meyer on Malachite. Uh, she uh, colored, uh, she did everything but lettering. Ben McRae, I think, did everything on his with Spuds. Um, uh, a couple of them found artists in Scott Snyder's Discord and just put out like an artist share, that, uh, artist shout out there uh, to get them to come on board. But then other than that, when people would ask, like I found mine because Ben O'Grady, the other editor, was like, I think this would be, uh, Deborah Lanchinese would be a great fit for you. And so we would, you know, just recommend artists and be like, from the vibe of your story, I think this would be great. And uh, otherwise, here's a great Reddit thing and here's a great Facebook group for it and different things like that. So we didn't, again, in honor of Scott, we didn't want to limit people's creative process. That's why we didn't ask for certain genres. That's why it was just like, Mm -hmm. hey, here's a jacket. What does that make you think of? Go. And so we wanted to do the same with the art teams. You know, you, you know, we also want to teach you to learn how to handle this stuff when it's all over. So if we don't right. show you all the various resources, you know, then we're not honoring Scott's spirit of uh, this whole thing is about teaching. And so we wanted to go that route instead of like matching people up ourselves. Yeah, that's that's really exciting because I'm I'm hoping that, you know, spinning out of this, we'll see, you know, however many stories you've got spin out their own Kickstarters in the near future to, you know, to publish their own indie, indie stuff. Um but yeah, I guess uh, I guess to get a little bit more into the details about the Kickstarter itself for folks that are interested, I mean, um, what's what's the what's the baseline pitch for this this whole thing? What kind of rewards can folks expect, and like how many stories are we looking at for this whole book? Do you want to go for a CK? <laughs> oh, uh, sure. Uh, okay. So we have twenty stories, um, hundred and twenty pages overall. Uh, we have, as you said, Skylar Patridge did the main cover, who is freaking amazing. Um, mm-hmm. You know, she's best known now for Resonant, Trial of the Amazons, and the upcoming Artemis from DC, but she's just fire everywhere. Like, you just, you can't throw a stone and not find something that she hasn't, you know, attempted to, uh, or gotten like a variant cover for or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. We also have Jesse Lonergan, um, Eisner nominated for Hedra, I think, yeah. and he did a variant cover for us. And then uh, we also have an art print available by Sebastian Paris, um, best known for We Ride Titans. So basically what we're doing is we have uh, two covers that they can choose from. Uh, we have a reward tier where they can buy uh, all three of those as art prints, which is selling quite well. And I like to see that they, they're just they're so gorgeous. And again, there with them, we just said, um, what does the jacket make you think of? Here's some of the stories from the collection what what's up like what does that make you think of and we just let them do their whole thing 
Uh, other than that, we have sticker uh, designs by um, Rob Jones, uh, who also did the trade dress for us. Um, a, cool little stickers with like various kinds of jackets on it, like a horror red, mm -hmm. uh, like a red riding hood kind of thing. And then another one that's a sci-fi jacket, et cetera. And then uh, the dog from my story, the art by Deborah Lanchnese is actually on a bookmark. So um, we have uh, stickers, bookmarks, three art prints. We have this uh, super duper cool signed Scott Snyder copy that's limited to 50 um, uh, copies uh, where he has agreed to to sign the book and mail it out. And for the deal, it's uh, pretty good because it costs quite a bit of money to get to a con to get somebody to sign a book for you. And so he was Definitely. nice enough to offer that for us. Is that all of it, Aubrey? Uh, stickers, I think that's everything. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The the bookmark also has some stuff by Rob Jones, like similar to yes. the designs for the stickers are also on that bookmark. So, um, I have a fussy sticker question. If you know the answer, are these <laughs> are these vinyl stickers or like more papery stickers? Do you know? They're from Comics Wheel Spring. They're two by two uh, circular gloss. That's that's a, the amount of information I know. I don't know if Aubrey knows a little more. I think they'll. Yeah, I'm. I I don't know. I have so many stickers. I should know questions like that. I'm guessing <laughs> no, they're I'm, a little more paperly with a gloss like finish. Yeah. Um, okay. I just ask because I think like stickers. Then I think, oh well, you know, you put them on your water bottle. You put them on your laptop. Like how how resilient are these stickers that we're talking about here? <laughs> I, I want to show off these really cool jackets. Um. <laughs> and see, I put them on my wall using the blue tacky tape so that they, because I like cannot commit to actually sticking them to anything. So uh, let me see. <laughs> um, well, cool. I guess, uh, Kara, Renee, do you guys have any last last questions before we wrap up here? I mean, honestly, I was also going to ask about the stickers. Um <laughs> <laughs> It's like, oh, great! You're shifting the paradigm of creating comics. Cool, cool, cool. But these stickers, though, <laughs> no, honestly, they everything about the the class and hearing about this anthology and things like that. It's, uh, I think, all of that is so incredibly cool and interesting, and I, I'm just very excited to read this anthology and you know just kind of just to really sit with it. So I I think that they they answered everything that I could potentially have questions about, you know, in this our our discussion. So cool. I, I yeah, feel feeling I mean, pretty content at the moment. Yeah, I I, I friggin' love anthologies, guys. So I'm I'm very hyped to add this one to my pile. And um yeah, loving loving our extended uh sleepover party here. <laughs> Sorry it has to end. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I'm really excited to see where this Kickstarter goes. I, I congrats as of right now. It looks like the Kickstarter is funded. Fingers crossed. We'll hit every single stretch goal and beyond. Um, I'm really looking forward to see how this thing pans out and looking forward to reading my copy once it's all wrapped up. Um, so I guess uh, CK, Aubrey, where can people find you on the Internet? I guess CK, let's start with you and then we'll go over to Aubrey. Where can people find you on the Internet if they want to talk more about this? Sure. I'm most active on uh, Twitter at Chris Does Comics. Uh, I you just sit there and uh, tweet and retweet about uh, lots of indie projects. Um, I'm also on Instagram at Chris does comics with an X, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm less frequent on that. You can also follow the project at tales from the cloakroom.com or follow them at, at cloakroom comics on Twitter, where we'll be posting a lot more art and things like this as we go along. Um, I will also say I am very happy, Mike, that my story made you cry because that is my goal <laughs> with all of my writing is to make people cry. So, yeah. All right. Well, then I'm going to be following you to the ends of the earth because that seems to be my most addicted type of comic that I am. So, uh... <laughs> I just want to read comics and feel things. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Aubrey, where can people find you on the yeah, internet? Yeah, um, I am at Taming the Muse on Twitter. Uh, that's probably where I'm most, the most active. Like, you can find me on Insta, but I don't post very often, and I don't look at it very often. So, Twitter is the place to be. Um, yeah, that's that's the main place. Awesome. Well, um, I'll post a link to all this stuff in the in the show notes. We'll have a link to the Kickstarter, and we really hope everyone out there can go out there and support it because it looks like it's a super solid project, and everything about it that I've seen so far is is really really cool. So, um. For those of you that are interested in the continuing uh, listening to I Read Comic Books because we are not dead as a podcast, next week's show is going to be the last one before we go on our July break. There's going to be a huge announcement about some stuff that's happening after July. We've got 
a lot of really cool things. Next week's episode is going to be me, Kate, and Paul talking about our Goodreads book of the month, our favorite read from 2021. Kate and Paul and I are going to be swapping some books that we really, really loved and uh, talking about them on the show. So look forward to that. If you're on the Discord, I'll be posting what those books are in advance so that you know. Um, otherwise, you can follow us all on Twitter. You can follow Renee at Rodriguez 29 You can follow Kara at Kara S. Sam, and you can follow me at Mike Rappin and the show at IRCB Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and the good old TikTok. This episode first aired on Patreon and it's possible because of our wonderful patrons. Join today for exclusive series like IRCB Movie Club, Saga of Saga, and so much more. Join now at patreon.com slash IRCB Podcast. If you haven't already, please rate and review our show five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, yes, they have ratings, or wherever you listen to podcasts because we deserve it. Even if we ruined Doctor Strange for some of you earlier. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You can join the IRCB Discord community to chat, <laughs> comics, and more. Plus, you can listen to our episodes live as we record every week. Check the link to our Discord in the show notes. Yeah, listen live at your own risk. Podcasts grow, <laughs> yeah. Pod- podcasts grow best when spread by word of mouth, so why not tell your friends, family, and local comic shop about IRCB? Infinity Shred is the best band in the universe. They do all of our music, and we can't thank them enough. Xander is a very cool guy who makes us sound extra cool every single week. We thank him enough, and you know we can't thank him enough for for being our editor and for bleeping out those Doctor Strange spoilers. Uh, I want to say thank you to CK and Aubrey for coming on the show. Uh, I want to say thank you to Renee and Kara as always, and everyone listening live on Discord. We love you to death, and all you fantastic human beings out there who listen to our show every week, we love you. And we we thank you so much for continuing to support RSCB. And until next time. Comics are good, and so are you.